if you like to give democracy to people, give them also the food they need, give them the better life they need. Freedom is as important as other things. That charismatic leaders give illusions, they don't give hope. And the problem with Facebook now is becoming dangerous is that it puts condition on the way that you are going to use it. For example, you see, for example, for the campaign Free Palestine, there are many restrictions, uh, restrictions yeah. that were censorship that was used, etc. Yeah. So uh, the, this charismatic leader you are looking for is the person who is going to generate corruption yeah. uh, inside your country. And in the beginning, they were listening to the people, but by the time, throughout the decades, they are going to listen to the people who are around them, who are really more corrupt than them. So pay attention to this. Uh, charismatic leaders are not really the answer. As democracy is not really alone is not the answer. Because what religion gives is this, this illusion sometimes that you give to people, that you are going to, that, to, that you are, that everybody is, uh, uh, who is not a Muslim or is not a Hindu is, uh, is an enemy. And then you, you are, you need, and then this is the first step, extremism. And then you are, you need to kill him because he does not belong to your religion. And then uh, this goes on. Uh, uh, you know, Gaddafi in Libya was a charismatic leader. Yeah. And uh, his power extended to all Africa. But what is the end? The end is that every dictator is going to fall. And uh, there is, Absolutely no space for nuanced conversation. The type of conversation that we have right now, it's so rare and people's attention is shrinking and shrinking and especially with the advent of TikTok in the this short video format, people are uh, not even patient enough to watch a 30 second video. That you teach your child to read a book, to sit, because you cannot concentrate. Your concentration on the video is different from your concentration in a text. If you have a society that does not think, it's useless. Although we don't speak the same language, yeah. but we share the same sensitiveness, the same sensibility, the same ideas, the same human values. So you cannot teach someone human values if he's dead to himself, if he's watching futile videos that do not mean anything. What is happening in Palestine does not mean anything to him. Yeah. What is happening in India with castes, etc., with Muslim skin, it does not mean anything to him. Or quite the opposite. Sometimes they would say, this is my enemy, kill him. We are facing a challenging moment in history. Challenging moment with populism, with the globalization, with the disappearance of the middle class, with wars, uh, and just wars. As I said before, we have to learn from history. If we don't learn from history, then things are, the same mistakes are going to be repeated. Namaste everyone. We are welcome to this special video for both Bartha. Uh, today, um, I am very uh, happy and proud to welcome our Tunisian friend, Meshaud. Mashad Ramdani, uh, I'd like to welcome you in Nepal as well as in this conversation. Uh, actually, we are in Kathmandu for uh, World Social Forum 2024 edition. And uh, right now we are in a hotel uh, near the venue where Mashad is, is staying. And we are going to have uh, some in-depth conversation. Uh, actually, actually, we have one panel also today in the afternoon. But I wanted to have uh, some in-depth conversation with him. Uh, that's why we are here. It will be better if he introduces himself. We'll start with the introduction and then we'll proceed to have, an conver uh, have a conversation. That will be in reference to all he has done in Tunisia as well as uh, the things we are going to discuss in at World Social Forum. So, Mesoud, you are welcome and please uh, introduce yourself briefly. Thank you so much. I'm really happy to be here. It's my first time in Nepal okay. and I like the place very much, the people. I think they're, they're very nice wherever you go. This is something I'm proud of and I'm happy of. Uh, my name is Mesoud Rondani. I'm a human rights activist. Uh, I was a trade union activist, secretary general of a union. 
And at the, ta- at the same time, I'm a human rights activist. I was vice president of the Tunisian Human Rights League at the time when uh, the Human Rights League, along with other organizations, has got the uh, the Nobel Prize for Peace oh, in 2015. Yeah. I was one of uh, the few founders of uh, the Tunisian Forum for Economic and Social Rights, which was an uh, which is an organization. I was which is an organization that speaks of a human of uh, social and economic rights and tries to defend them because we believe that they are the most important rights along with the freedom, democracy, etc. I was president of the Tunisian Forum for Economic and Social Rights. During the revolution, I constituted, along with other friends, a committee to defend regions in Tunisia, revolting regions in Tunisia. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty for my age. Uh, long <laughs> yeah. Of course, yeah. Okay. So, uh, recently you sent me one article that was published as a book chapter in the book Authoritarianism in the Arab World, Incubator for Corruption, Terrorism. Yes. Incubator for Terrorism. Okay. Yes. So that is a quite long article, but I read it quite uh, passionately. It was very interesting and in-depth. Um, look at the state of Tunisian society. Uh, I think it was uh, written around 2015-16, right? It was published at 16, that time. yeah. Okay. And a uh, lot of time has passed uh, after that also. So one particular thing, uh, few things struck me quite uh, importantly. One of them is uh, when you studied the pattern of terrorism or the origin of the terrorists, or the family backgrounds, you found that uh, most of them were not from poor and totally disadvantaged groups or, or parts of the society. They came from relatively well-to-do families in the middle class. They're well-educated. And um, so that observation that you make, that is in contrary uh, to the common view, especially in the Western world, that people uh, um, go to terrorist uh, organizations and they are lured by terrorist organizations out of poverty and marginalization. So that is an observation uh, that uh, that is different from the common common perception about terrorism. So right now, it's a, I think it's a global issue about the alienation of the middle class and middle class not getting its own bargain in, in different countries, even in the Western countries and being disaffected. And especially in countries like Tunisia, even in countries like India, in Nepal. So there is some disaffection among the middle class. So that's common. But uh, in Tunisia's case, you have uh, related, related, correlated that with the rise of uh, this terrorist threat. So can we talk in some depth about that link between uh, the discontent of the middle class and terrorism? So we'll start the conversation there. Yes, uh, uh, quite exactly. Uh, it is uh, uh, that article came after the revolution. Yeah. And people began to wonder, to their surprise, why these people who were asking for democracy and human rights and uh, social justice, dignity, etc., have turned to, into terrorism. some type of uh, terrorism. Yeah. And the, fl- the places I tried to visit during the revolution, I've seen some places in, in, in some uh, unhappy areas and scandent areas, and the, the young people I've seen during the revolution asking for democracy and human rights, later on some of them have turned into uh, some type of extremist group, into extremist groups. So while I try to understand the fact that why does that happen, and uh, the the other uh, the idea, the prejudice I had before is that these people were uh, poor and they were unemployed and they were that's why they turned to terrorism. And then later on, I realized that these people are not all of them poor. Yeah. They are not all of them. Uh, coming from poor, uh, marginalized uh, background. 
Uh, then I began to try to understand the phenomenon uh, because many people believe that marginalized, even Bush himself has, at a certain time has said that uh, uh, we are going to fight terrorism through hope, meaning giving people uh, hope. But then later on, they, they were disillusioned, and so that's why they tried to fight terrorism with arms, etc., and neither worked. Yeah. Well, either with hope or That's because the, the, the problem, but, but you're right. I mean, the, the, there is some problem with the middle class and this, I think it's related to globalization to, uh, we are living in, uh, in a world that tries to get on trying to, to quell totally the middle class. Yeah. You have either a majority of poor or a minority. One person. One, one person that, that's the, uh, the aim of globalization. The, the, uh, because capitalism for me, uh, and I have seen it in Tunisia, has survived through a big bulk of middle class. Because that's that middle class that avoids any type of uh, uh, of extremism or any type of uh, it has kept the uh, society a bit in a sort of equilibrium where you have a majority in the middle class and the uh, the the new states that uh, came in the arab world in the in the 50s and 60s they were states that were I mean, dictators, yeah. but at the same time, they tried to keep everything in the state, the state profit, giving health, giving uh, education for all, uh, and trying to give uh, all this uh, insurance, and etc. And the state played an important role. And the state played an important role in this state providence, it has given hope to the people. Because for me, after that study, I realized that the absence of hope is one of the causes of the of, of terrorism. It's not the main cause, but there are many causes to it. But the absence of hope, and now the Arab world in, lives in a, quite an absence of hope. But people have two things, either they go to terrorism, or they go on uh, undocumented migration, yeah. and they die in the sea. And it does not mean that all these people were poor who die in the sea. That means that people who lack hope, because people, even in religion, religion, religion is one way, an answer to a certain worry yeah. that people have. But it can, peace, it can be peaceful. My father, was a religious person, but he was peaceful. He never uh, forced me to uh, to do it. But that peaceful Islam has changed into sort of radicalized Islam, where you have uh, where you have uh, you take revenge from a society. And I like the word revenge because that's what happens. The, these young people try to take revenge. Okay, you didn't take care of us, you didn't help us, you are not going to offer us hope in the future, you are politicians who are talking about politics, you are wearing your tie and your suit, etc. And you are trying to talk to us, but we have no hope. So we are going to revenge. And these, uh, to take revenge from, and this fact of revenge from the state, that used to be a state that helped, a state that was providence that used, that state that gave education, etc., now has become a state that gives nothing, yeah. that gives no answer. So revolution has brought hope to the people that dignity, the word dignity is very important, that people, that means dignity does not mean only some superficial work. Dignity means that I find a job, I live a decent life, I work, etc. So this absence of dignity or this neglect of people, uh, and y y you see uh, in the article that I spoke of the Arabic word hugra, okay. disdain. This disdain, people, uh, young people, when I talk to them, because in that article I went to many regions, interior regions where there is a bit of extremism, etc. The, uh, the the word disdain is repeated. Disdain means that you don't pay attention to us, you neglect us, and that. That feeling, because religion is also, is mainly a feeling, 
is mainly a feeling. It comes to embrace feelings and give some type of answer, whether you believe it or not, an answer in the other world yeah. or an answer for uh, morals now, etc. But uh, any religion can be extremist. Hinduism can be, Christianism can be, uh, populism now that is rising can be a sort of... Uh, so this revenge from society, I found it that this is the most important. A society that disdains young people, that does not pay attention to them, that does not answer their problems, that replaced hope with deception. And the, okay, okay yeah. we'll come to Hogra and uh, dignity once again, because that's very, very important point that you raised there. Uh, recently, even I, I made one brief video about Tunisia, I shared, with you, uh, shared it with you also, that I made uh, after I read a series of articles in New York Times about the self-immolations in yeah. Tunisia. Unfortunately, in Nepal also, we had a couple of ex uh, incidents like that. And one young man killed himself by burning himself. Uh, I think it was around eight or nine months ago. And uh, there was a um, huge wave of youth disappointment. And uh, I could relate uh, that with the uh, state of the young people in Tunisia also. Uh, I think that's not the problem even limited to Nepal and Tunisia. Even I was recently reading one newsletter from Dan, Dan Wang. He's a China commentator. He writes a very respected newsletter annually about China. And many people rely on him to assist the even the investment climate in China. So he's such a um, reputed person. He writes one long letter, six, seven thousand words long uh, every year. So in the letter he wrote uh, at the end of 2023, he mentions two words to explain the psychology of the Chinese youth. Mm -hmm. Those are tangping. One is tangping and another, another is run. Are you and run? Run is in English. That's the English term they use in use while speaking Chinese. They mix that from um, uh, English. And tangping is the proper Chinese word. Mm. That means, uh, I think that means lying down or giving up. Okay. Yeah. So, so that's the attitude of so many young people in China. Again, China is also suffering from this uh, economic decline in youth unemployment, especially youth unemployment, unemployment over the past uh, many years. That's why even the youth are disgruntled in a country doing as well as China is doing right now. It's the second biggest economy in the world. Even their uh, disaffection among the young is um, quite uh, strong. So uh, let's dwell with this uh, psychology of the young people where there are very few prospects of uh, moving upwards and then they have uh, the baggage of expectations from family from society mm. that they'll do something great or at least they'll lead a better life than their parents that expectation is there so in that article you talk uh, about the period between 2011 and 2015-16 that is the post, yeah. post revolution but before the pu publication of that article unfortunately uh, things have changed for the worse after yeah. that uh, that article came out and that's what i focus in that video uh, that i made so can can we now talk about the transition of tunisia from a relatively functional democracy to uh, completely dysfunctional and even sham democracy after the latest elections in initially around nine percent people voted right in the latest elections so can we talk about that transition that that i'm trying to emphasize because even in nepal there are voices that try to tell us that democracy is not working that's why we should have some form of authoritarianism even those voices are starting to uh, people are starting to raise their voices so what's your particular experience from tunisia in relation to the young people and about the difference between authoritarianism and uh, democracy and the um, regression of the Tunisian uh, governance from a relatively functioning democracy to uh, effective uh, authoritarianism. Well, uh, in the workshop, I had 
two days ago, I explained to the people in front of me that there are certain conditions in order to democracy so could survive. It could not survive without economic and social, uh, certain economic and social uh, justice. Yeah. And the Tunisian revolution for me was something of uh, the main important thing. What the aspiration of young people, what people were looking for is that their economic and social rights to get, so they get rid of unemployment. They thought that in getting rid of dictatorship in 2011, they are going to live a proper life. They are going to have to, to find the regime that answers their demands, democracy, freedom, and social justice. But then what happened later on, that we got elections. And these elections has got with political Islam and with other many other parties that did not change the economic situation. And after the, situa the, the revolution, the precarity, the economic precarity has, uh, has become even more worse than before because of the deletion of the state, because of after the revolution, because these people had no idea about what to do later on because of international situation also. The international conditions, they were not, you could not live without the help of the IMF and without the World Bank. So they, once they, you know what happened to Greece, for example, when they have these socialist uh, ideas or they want to get rid of international debts, yeah, et cetera. Yeah. Do you know what happened to Spain, et cetera? So the, those who came later, they, come, they came with the idea of following the same economic system, which led to an even worse situation. And people say, okay, hang on. What is democracy without? Uh, what did it bring to us on the material level? Did it bring to us jobs? Did it bring us better infrastructure? Did it bring to us a better life? No, they didn't. So what's the use of this democracy? What's the use of freedom if life under dictatorship was better than now? And I think this is a problem not of, uh, in Tunisia yeah. only, it's a problem all over the world, I must go. Go all on. over the world. You know what's happening now in Europe? You know what's happening in America? Yeah. You know Trump, for example, a populist who, is, uh, uh, who has got billions of dollars, companies who is a very aggressive, who has got problems with women, who has got problems with corruption, and people like him. You know why? Because this populism tries to tries to give uh, easy answers to difficult questions, yeah, yeah. and these uh, easy answers they are illusions. But people like them because they're fed up with politicians who give them something, and then they didn't achieve it. So they better listen to someone who tries to give them to say something clear, explain it to them, etc., and be more aggressive against politicians, etc. Now in Europe, what is happening? In Europe, the people think that democracy is no longer important. That's why they turn to extreme left, uh, ex sorry, extreme right. They turn to uh, Miloni in Italy, which is an extreme right, which uh, they turn to many, uh, Hungary and many other countries, you have ex extreme right governments. And these extreme right governments, they try to kill democracy by, by any means. But people like those answers because they think their problems are in the migrant that comes to them. And migration, the more problems are in the South, the more migration is going That's to be. Great. And more people are going to die in the sea from Tunisia, from Sub-Saharan Africa, etc. So the problem now is that now people, uh, the, the, the crux of the matter is what people should understand is the following. If you like to give democracy to people, give them also the food they need, give them the better life they need. And the, now, the interior situation, the climate problem, the international situation, globalization as 
a way to dominate the world with uh, imperialistic countries, all this is going to lead to more problems, is going to, and people begin to ask, hang on, because you know, what happened in the end of 19th and 20th century, what happened is that uh, people were afraid of certain communism, etc., that is coming. So even capitalist countries are trying to give an answer. They let trade unions, they limited the hours of work, they give better wages, etc. They, uh, they include women, involved women in work, and all these ideas seem to us very good ideas. So there is a better life, there is a middle class that is going on and working. Now, if you have now, if you come now, and you see that, uh, and then people accepted the liberal democracy, and, okay, that's better. And democracy was accepted, was taken, was swallowed by the people, and capitalism was accepted. In America, they did the New Deal in 2030, and 2030, something, 36 or something. 19, so capitalism, 19, 19, sorry, 1936. And, and this, uh, and other countries also, and the left groups also can give, were able to give solutions. Now the leftist groups, leftist parties in Europe, the trade unions are losing their grounds yeah. slowly. The, the socialist party in France is losing totally. There are a few thousands of people before there were millions of people. Yeah. The, the communist party in Italy has lose, lost ground because very strong party, etc. So these, why? Because of, they, they, they could no longer give answers to the people. And that's why I believe in social forums. I believe in social forums. And that's what I said the day before yesterday. I said, you should think of giving to social movements a political end, a political answer. It's not meant to be an ideology, but it is a, a sort of a political answer. You have an idea, a political idea. Give it a political idea where you have democracy, where you have certain social justice, where you can give people, young people hope. But otherwise, if you, if you rely on what's happening in the world. And this, this, this the uh, social forums and the meeting between different organizations, etc., can really bring strength. And this strength can really give an answer because the more the city, the more we have this globalization and this rely on only on financing, the more we are losing the, the, the middle class, the, 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 the worse the situation is going to be. And we need, when the situation is worse, when it gets worse, you need to give an answer. You need, this answer can be terrorism. And this is dangerous. It can be extremism. It is also dangerous. It can be the refusal, the xenophobia, where you refuse all the other people from the outside. You're, but when you give human ideas, when you believe that, that salvage is general, whether, whether in Nepal or in France or in Tunisia, you can't really give hope to people. And you can get rid of this uh, of terrorism and extremism. But at the same time, you could really face globalization with its uh, financing ideas because uh, it, it is something that changed even governments. Governments could not do anything. Now you establish communist state or the socialist or whatever, but then you rely on the outside world. You cannot, in Nepal, uh, ex exclude your relationship with India, with China, etc. So you need, in order to have a strong background, you need, and where you could put your feet on strongly, you need to believe in humanity in general. Okay, uh, we'll talk about this global aspect of this later on. Right now, can we once again elaborate about this uh, regression, democratic regression in Tunisia and what that has brought about uh, over the past one or two years? So, can you compare the time right now with the euphoria that was in 2011? So, what has changed over this decade? So, what's the exact mood of the people, of the youth, young people in uh, Tunisia? I'm asking this question because 
I was uh, looking, uh, watching that video of one journalist who had recorded uh, one brief video before burning himself. So he was from uh, some inside area of Tunisia. Yeah, I have seen uh, that. Okay, yeah. okay, okay. okay. Uh, Catherine, Catherine, Catherine yeah. Yeah, she yeah, talks yeah. about, maybe he's from that region. region no, he's itself. from Catherine, yeah. Okay, so <clears throat> that's quite heartbreaking. So, how much representative is that? How many young people in Tunisia are that desperate? Or uh, do you see any improvements over the past few months or few years? So, what's the latest situation in Tunisia? Then we'll move to the global stage. The, uh, the situation, well, three periods. Okay. Uh, the first period is the hope, the euphoria. Nobody believed that such a regime or repressive regime that existed that relied on security forces is going to go away so simply because people were relied together. So that's the euphoria. That's the hope. Yeah. But then later on, quickly, that hope has gone away. That's what I said, that democracy was not... We had transparent elections. We had a committee for the election that made every election transparent for the first time in the history of Tunisia. But then we had problems with political Islam that did not really get well with the situation, did not know what to do, whether to accept religion or tolerate other groups. But the other groups also didn't have an answer to the problems of the people. And that's why in 2019, People, so political Islam has regressed from 1 million something in the elections to 800,000 to 400,000. Mm -hmm. And I believe that if the other elections are going to come, then he's going to dwindle down again. But then what happened is that we have elected the president that, that really uh, said, uh, who has no real functions except the uh, the army okay. and uh, the external relations, the foreign relations, etc. But then later on, along with the army, he grabbed the power, the power yeah. in 2021. So, and so how repressive is he now? How repressive? Uh, yeah, and and, and then he established a real dictatorship along with the army. He put uh, now most uh, leaders of political parties in prison. Uh, he has also no ideas of what to do, but he established a real dictatorship. And this is the first time in the history of Tunisia that the army uh, has got a big role through this. Before the army intervened, but not, but always they go back to their places. And uh, now the, first, the army has got a role. Oh. And this is dangerous for the future of Tunisia. So with the help of the army, with the help of security forces, they are now they are establishing a real dictatorship. Okay. And, and this real dictatorship is who didn't come from any political party that really somewhat like Trump yeah. is a bit this uh, symbol of somebody who says, okay, now we don't like political parties. We don't like the elites. And people say, yes, they were fed up with these elites. We were fed up with political parties who talk ever, the old day, but they didn't answer. So, but now the people began to scratch their heads and say, yeah. okay, but this one didn't answer our question, our problems also, yeah. So all the uh, major um, leaders from political parties, they are behind the bars right now, right? Yeah. What about civil society? How openly can you speak in Tunisia right now? Um, not very much. Okay. Not very much because uh, there was a problem after the twenty, after the twenty twenty one, okay. after this coup that has been made. Civil society was divided. Was divided because of the main thing that most of them were against. They t wanted to take revenge from political Revenge, Islam. Yeah. And this is wrong, of course. Okay. Myself, I took a stand from the beginning that if you like democracy, you need to accept everyone. Okay. And this is a, a voice I'd like to say to everybody. Now, you can only, you can combat any extreme ideas only through dialogue. And what I told you uh, uh, for the elections, 
the go down of the elections is that people have experienced political Islam and they are going to take a stand against it. Against it. So let things go on. Let toler let's tolerate. You cannot combat terrorism. And this you can get it from the United States. What did they did in Afghanistan? What they did in Iraq? What they did in Syria? They could not combat terrorism through uh, only force. Yeah. So uh, even in our societies, in Muslim societies, most of them, you could not combat the, uh, uh, political Islam through uh, letting, trying to eliminate them or uh, suffocate them or not letting them speak. So uh, this, uh, of course, he seized this opportunity and uh, he did that. So now, myself, I don't know whether, what's going to happen to me in the future. But you, but this situation that we took it from under, you have to take a decision. You have to take a decision throughout your life, yeah. whether you are going to live your life as a doctor or as a professor or whatever you are. And the, then you do nothing and you, you take care of your children and then you, you lead a quieter life in the shade and you go on. Or you try to be useful to the people around you. For at least your children are going to remember you as a person who didn't. When you teach them about freedom, uh, you give them ex the example of... of uh, Without feeling guilt. Uh, when, uh, absolutely. <laughs> so so this uh, is a decision we took from our to, uh, early 20s. So we are going to do that. Whatever is, uh, the situation uh, will be. Okay. This is very interesting and relevant for Nepal. Now, I'll relate the two experiences with Nepal. The things you explained about the tumultuous history of Tunisia after revolution. In Nepal also, we had uh, one, we had, in fact, we had two huge uh, revolts, popular revolts, not the armed ones. We had one armed one also. In 1990, there was one peaceful movement that uh, uprooted the absolute monarchy. Yeah. Nepal went to constitutional monarchy. After a few years, again, there were people restless with that system. They started armed conflict that lasted for one decade from 1996 to 2006. In 2006, uh, again, there was second people's movement that again uprooted the monarchy that had become active again at the end of that insurgency period. And uh, that from 2006, the transition period started and the things quite resemble with Tunisia in Nepal also. So again, there are so many hopes about the uh, democratic setup that came after 2006. Again, the, most of those hopes, hopes were dashed. Again, impunity was there, corruption was there and instability was there. We could not uh, form the constitution uh, out of first constituent assembly. We had to go for the second election for the constituent assembly and we lost one more decade. And ultimately, um, in 2015, we got the new constitution. But now, and we are the federal republic right now. But now, uh, we have been in this setup for some seven and eight years. And now some people think so and are propagating the idea that we'll be better off with without democracy. And even those people who don't reject democracy outright, they are saying that these political parties are useless. That's why we should go for go for a political leaders. Interestingly, in the latest round of elections, uh, three of Nepal's major cities. Uh, independent candidates won the posts of mayor, the, the city leaders. And one experiment is ongoing and many people in Nepal, not only in those three cities, they think that the solution now is some charismatic, quote-unquote, uh, apolitical, outside the political elites. So we need that kind of leader. So there is that widespread belief. And, and the Another side of this political, spe political spectrum, some other people, they are right now saying that we have 
been unstable because we lost the anchor of monarchy of the religion that's why we should come back go back to the era where nepal used to be an hindu rashtra in which the state religion was hindu religion so that lasted until uh, 2006 before 2006 nepal was hindu adhiraji hindu kingdom okay so some people want us to go back to that period that's why there is so much confusion in nepal right now and even the political leaders leaders are confused that's the main part and we in the civil society have the job of educating both the people as well as the political leaders mm -hmm. and pressurizing them to move in the right direction that's why i was trying to have this conversation yesterday uh, as i mentioned to you earlier i talked to harsmander the activist from india activist and journalist from india and I was trying trying to gain insight from the Indian experience also. And uh, now uh, your experience right now, you said about the um, uh, the so-called apolitical nature of the person who grabbed power in Tunisia. He came there and he, after coming that, uh, all the problems of Tunisia, uh, he, um, as I see it, he tried to shoot the messenger so that the message will not be delivered, right? He is trying to repress, he is um, bringing army to the roads, he is, he is um, trying to repress the voices of the people so that he will look good. That's at the end of the day, that's how the dictatorships work everywhere. So that thing is there and I think that's usually related to, um, relatable to us in Nepal. And I hope uh, people in Nepal will... Uh, benefit from from the experience of Tunisia and my belief is that belief is that uh, It's always great to learn from other people's mistakes other countries mistakes other societies mistakes so that uh, We can avoid making them That's one aspect uh, Now let's talk about uh, something more global or something of more global dimension is uh, you must have noticed and uh, we talked about earlier before starting this interview also uh, the fate of Alexei Navalny. He, was, uh, he seems to have been uh, killed quite brutally, cruelly, in a penal colony somewhere in the Arctic or somewhere inside the Russia. So again, I was talking to about this insecurity of the authoritarian regimes uh, with the Arsha also yesterday. Uh, in India also, the creeping authoritarian government uh, so in in many countries in the world right now we are seeing the elected autocracies right mm -hmm. people who come to power through uh, relatively uh, valid elections but then after getting power they went they go on to subvert democracy that's the situation of India right now and uh, I was giving an example and I think that's quite useful here also so in in India there is one political prisoner he was, I think he was 80 plus octogenarian old man who spent his whole life for, for the upliftment of the uh, tribal people in most in some of the most disadvantaged areas in India. So somehow the Indian state could not tolerate him and then uh, they accused him of uh, subverting the state just they, um, like they do in China and Russia and they jailed him. And uh, he had one condition called Parkinson's disease in which there is there are terrible tremors. You cannot even hold the glass to drink water. Mm -hmm. His conditions deteriorated and inside the jail he could not drink water. That's why uh, he asked for a straw, simple straw to drink water. But the jail authorities are so... Uh, disempowered they could not even make a decision to provide the old mean old man with the straw apparently they had to get the permission from a up maybe i don't know if that is the prime minister or home minister and that poor old man that he didn't uh, get that straw for months and he struggled with drinking water and even uh, that that news came out in media also. People make video, people ask questions. Even then, state was so insensitive, brutal, and, and at the same time, insecure. I think 
it is so insecure that they try they are trying to teach lesson also but they are insecure also because any anyone who speaks against the establishment they think that poses the poses threat to the entire country that's the narrative they have made and uh, as we see globally including in the united states uh, where trump is trying to make a comeback we see this dynamics in which the state the people in the people in power they are um, gathering more and more power and they are disempowering people and they are getting increasingly intolerant towards dissent of any form and things are get uh, deteriorating also because of the uh, media and communication ecosystem that we have especially with the social media and the weaponization of social media and the tools that the state and the powers can employ that thing is that is making the life even more difficult for activists and civil society everywhere again there are so many tra tragic examples in india so uh, how do you see this ecosystem of power of media of the atrophy of the conventional media of the rise of the social media so how do you see the people like us navigating this in the coming days so how do we um, increase our voice and how do we uh, make it more effective so what is your thought on this part well uh, i mean let's say that social that anything that is the new technology it can be used like science in the positive or in the negative yeah. way depending on how many people are able to use it the way you are going to use it for which benefit you are going to use it for example in the arab spring in 2011 facebook has played a very important role yeah. because it was the way that gathered young people through facebook and then when you have problems in the uh, trying to stop it through the governments etc they always use ways to uh, to, uh, to uh, yeah so all this is something so it depends on the way you use it now social media the problem with social media is that and uh, uh, all uh, uh, all social media in fact that they can be used by those who have the money like Musk and everybody else, I mean, like, uh, uh, so all these people can be used. And the problem with Facebook now is becoming dangerous is that it puts condition on the way that you are going to use it. For example, you see, for example, for the campaign Free Palestine, there are many restrictions, uh, restrictions yeah. that were censorship that was used, etc. Yeah. So I think that First of all, uh, civil society has played an important role during the Arab Spring. And we, th I think that it was something very great, but we need political parties. We need political parties. But these political parties, the problem with political parties is that they are never, they are not able to give a concrete answer to the problems of people. You need to give, we talked about uh, terrorism and the deception of people. So you need to give hope to people. Those who were in Syria and Iraq, they like to die because they don't have any hope. The self emolition of Bazizi in, uh, in Sidi Bouzid in Tunisia, because he doesn't have a hope. He, because he was uh, prevented from doing a job to, from which to eat by the government. So that's, he took revenge from, by his body, through his body. So what, what is the answer? Not to only Bazizi, there were many young people who were uh, 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 emolated from him. Now, what you need as political party is to give these people real hope to say that you are going to uh, you are this is our answer to your problems and you the first thing that you give them is that uh, the, uh, the, this charismatic leader you are looking for is the person who is going to generate corruption yeah. uh, inside your country because corruption because why charismatic leader uh, uh, in our in the history of tunisia the history of egypt the history of syria the history of the arab world which has studied very well these people these dictators they gave hope they say okay 
set up, we are going to give you food, we are going to give you jobs, etc. But in the long run, what happened is that they made up around them people who were corrupt and who uploaded them, and then they continued the corruption. And in the beginning, they were listening to the people, but by the time, throughout the decades, they are going to listen to the people who are around them, who are really more corrupt than them. So pay attention to this. Uh, charismatic leaders are not really the answer. As democracy is not really alone, is not the answer. Democracy should have something else. People need the freedom. They have, they need to have freedom. They, leave, uh, they need to live freely. But at the same time, you need to give them to answer because freedom without their, their food, their everyday, it's not, it's not. So you need to, to explain to them that freedom is as important as other things, that charismatic leaders give illusions, they don't give hope, that in the long run, they are going to be the most corrupt people because they are going to have around them corrupt people who are going to benefit from, from this charisma. And then they are going to quell every opposition to them and every po person who is going to p speak of corruption. And then there is going to, co you are going to construct a sort of megalomania yeah. in the, inside the person to say that I am the leader. You don't have to speak. I am the country. I am the country. Yeah. Okay. And, it's, and then look even in the family. You don't need a father who doesn't listen to his children. You don't need a mother who doesn't really to impose his ideas. Because if you impose your ideas, you find somebody else who give to your children ideas, etc. So now, if you, the most, the book I talked to you about, that uh, Arab uh, authoritarianism is the incubator of terrorism because you don't let anybody else to speak. Yeah. And when I spoke, this I spoke from my experience in Tunisia, in Algeria, in all uh, in all other countries. What happens is that you you suppress any opposition, and then you find these people, these young people, they didn't start in 2011. They started from the war in Afghanistan, yeah. the war in, in, in other places, in Iraq in 2003, when Americans, when Americans came. So these young people, since they don't have, since they don't afford to them tolerance, talking, communication. Because from the experience, once again, when you speak to these people, when you communicate with these people, when you listen to these people, you can you can have ideas you can, and you can give a, uh, convince them. Because otherwise, everybody is going to his, stick to his shell, and then you are going to have young people who really don't accept you and don't accept freedom. So freedom is necessary. Tolerance is necessary. You need to tolerate even people who don't you don't agree with. And then at the same time, you need to get, give real, concrete answers, real hope to these people. Because what religion gives is this, this illusion sometimes that you give to people, that you are going to that, to get, that you are that everybody is uh, uh, who is not a Muslim or is not an Hindu is uh, is an enemy, and then you you are you need and then this is the first step extremism, and then you are you need to kill him because he does not belong to your religion, and then uh, this goes on. But, but if you tolerate people, if you accept your their ideas, if you leave them, I live in a family. In my family. My wife is prays five times a day, but we live together. We accept each other. She fasts in Ramadan. I do not do, but we live together because there are other fields of understanding that we, we could live on. We discuss about the future of our children. And I'm happy that in my real life, that my children are also believe, they do believe in this discussion. So that's, that goes, this is a microcosm only, a small thing, but that goes to the country too. If you don't speak with people, if you don't try to convince them, if you don't tolerate their ideas, then you are going to learn. So 
the what really impressed people outside the uh, the Arab world is that these uh, these slogans that uh, that have been there freedom liberty democracy and social justice but in fact social justice comes first that's why they believe in charismatic leaders but charismatic leaders are not the answer but uh, the answer is what is that those leaders who have got parties give some type of answer to the people they say to them they discuss with them so what happened during all these uh, uh, these years were after before the this coup of 2021 we were calling me and few people for a national dialogue and nobody listened to you because they thought the national dialogue well, I'm going to discuss with you national dialogue. Who are you? You don't belong to part. But I'm civil society. Okay, civil society, you are talking. But you need a national dialogue. We need a political, a social dialogue. We need uh, competent people to d discuss the economy. We need competent people to discuss the democracy, the civil rights, etc. We need people who are who, who talk to us, who explain to us what is tolerance, what is democracy, what is what is social justice, etc. Because these slogans they are vague unless you try to be concrete. So you need these people. So without a dialogue, without tolerance, without nothing is going to work. Charismatic leaders, and this is my experience, they live uh, uh, you know Gaddafi in Libya was a charismatic leader yeah. and uh, his power extended to all Africa. But what is the end? The end is that every dictator is going to fall. Every dictator falls. This is from Saddam Hussein uh, to Gaddafi to Ben Ali in Tunisia to all these dictators are going to fall because they don't have the answer. In the beginning, they give, they are charismatic, even other, maybe in one year, maybe in six months, maybe in, 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 in two years, maybe he's going to fall. But why? Because he gave the illusion that he's good, that he's a charismatic leader, that he's going to give the answer to people. But then later on, he couldn't give the answer to the people. He made his family is around him, his people around, those who applaud him are around him, the army is around him, but they are benefiting from this situation. Not the people, the people are not benefiting from. So the answer now is that we think how we make democracy work. And deliver. Absolutely. So, what struck me yesterday when I was talking with Harsh was also the erosion of human values of love, of compassion, of tolerance. I think we are witnessing a global decline in those values. Absolutely. Especially with the spread of this hate and bigotry with by using the social media. Absolutely. That's uh, some places are worse than others, but I think no place in the world is left yeah. uh, or is unaffected by that. So how can we... That's an open question. I am ruminating partially. You may attempt to uh, answer the question or we can leave that open also for the audience to think about. So, even until our childhood, there was a time when some, some set of values were sacred for everyone, everyone, like the commitment to truth, even though there is some difference in interpretation of some facts. But at some basic level, everybody agreed. Uh, in Nepal and in South Asia, there is this uh, caste system, which is very oppressive, discriminatory. But things were changing for good then, because uh, more people were uh, coming to the terms uh, with the constitutional provision that you could not discriminate on the basis of a caste. That's why that's, this caste system is bad. Everybody agreed. And even though there is some superstition and some old people stuck to that practice, uh, things were going in the right direction. 
But now with the advent of social media and after this 20, 23, 25 years, now suddenly people with some of the most regressive ideas, they have got the platform. And now, now they are openly able to call for discrimination. They are now called, uh, they are uh, free to give uh, casteist names, just the, they do the racist names in America and elsewhere. So those things are there and uh, sensational material, so, uh, of course social media algorithms, they uh, prioritize the sensational contents. Those with the most extreme ideas and with the most hate and bigotry and the call to violence, they are sensational. And with the spread of those ideas, the young, young people who have uh, come, who have, uh, who have come to know the world uh, after the advent of social media, they don't know the world that used to exist before them. That's why this is everything for them. And they are accustomed to an environment in which even hate speech is usual part. Bullying is usual part. Trolling is the daily experience. And uh, they uh, are growing up, uh, taking all that in. And uh, they think that is normal. They think that behavior with which is quite unusual by the standard of our childhood. That's now normal. And there is absolutely no space for nuanced conversation. The type of conversation that we have right now. It's so rare and people's attention is shrinking and shrinking. And especially with the advent of TikTok in the this short video format. People are uh, not even patient enough to watch a 30 second video. They'll scroll after 2 or 3 seconds. And they'll spend the whole day scrolling that thing and people are moving away from the books and moving away from even movies when it comes to young generation it's difficult to make the children today to sit for one movie that's 90 minutes or 100 minutes long and there is absolute absolute fragmentation of the intake that are receiving when it comes to uh, the different mediums of uh, information and knowledge and uh, because of that we are uh, uh, young generation is growing up which um, literally doesn't know what reading a book, book outside their curriculum is they don't know how it feels to watch a whole movie sitting for two or three hours a do or a documentary or some informative material let alone uh, read a 25 page article that you sent me and I read and that's so, so uh, insightful. So right now I'm even more worried about the future of the uh, young generation, which will have to uh, negotiate and which will have to navigate in such difficulty, especially when it comes to Asia and Africa, everything is going to deteriorate, uh, deteriorate with the uh, advance in climate crisis, climate change, so many extreme weather events are going on and especially there is a very very troubling trend in India in South Asia where the uh, politicians the ruling politicians have uh, now have a strategy in which whatever whatever happens there because of climate crisis climate change or uh, any other natural disaster they'll somehow manage to deflect the attention from themselves to the minorities so that the people people in the majority they'll be always angry and agitated and combative towards the minorities and they are able to channel that dissatisfaction that frustration towards the minorities and um, the situation is being very very difficult uh, even materially emotionally uh, and in every way for the minorities and that's especially true for India and even in Nepal some early troubling signs are there and we are trying to make people understand the threat posed by that uh, that tendency so since you are here in Kathmandu for World Social Forum and we are having so many dialogues um, um, as the part of the as the formal session uh, in the in the forum 
so uh, how do you see the this communication ecosystem how can we potentially change it or change our ways or what's your idea about uh, spreading uh, things in the audio visual medium because so many people are now shifting from text to audio visual and young generation is growing up without seeing anything in text other than their textbooks so uh, how do we spread the ideas of democracy ideas of toleration uh, of moderation so um, what are your thoughts about this changing ecosystem what's the situation in tunisia especially related to social media uh, i think it will be good to wrap up this session with an answer to this question well i think see i give you an example 20 years ago i went to france so i go so often to france uh, when i go in the tube metro train you find 80% of young people having a book with them book uh, reading uh, reading them in that fact, was 20 years ago yeah. 10 years ago also about 50% of young people when you get in the metro you find them reading now okay. you find 90% of young people not talking to each other but having their phone and discussing through the and watching videos with their headphones and you have you try to have a look at these videos most of them they're superficial they mean nothing same thing in Tunisia you find people people sit in the cafes young people in the cafes they sit for long here in Nepal I haven't seen cafes but people there sit in cafes young people and you find four people sitting together and each one in four uh, taking her now the idea of uh, a text to read this also, this has got to, in, in education, it depends. Education is a very important problem. Education in the family is very important. That you teach your child to read a book, to sit. Because you cannot concentrate. Your concentration on the video is different from your concentration in a text. Your concentration in the text. People, old people who have got Alzheimer's, Later on, because they didn't, they start, they dwindled, the reading has dwindled down. So, in order, these doctors like you, okay, they advise people to keep reading yeah. in order to keep concentration. That's important for your memory. That's important for your discussion. So, people have got two things. Either they read, they need to read, and they need also to communicate, to discuss. What, ha what is happening now is that neither do they discuss, Neither do they read books, so they, cons they are concerned. So education is something very important. So let's get back to this, to the books, to the idea of books, to the idea of discussion. Even through, even through small videos to give the dangers, to say the dangers. You need to combat this idea of futile videos in, 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 in th even through spots showing to young people yeah. the, the danger of things. This you need. Civil society can play an important role of that, to give people. Because if you have a society that does not think, it's useless. It's useless. If you have everybody stick to his uh, videos, to his ideas, to his, you are not going to have a society. What is, civil, what is the role of civil society is to believe that humanity, that people in a country or people in other countries, what's the idea of social forums? That although we don't speak the same language, yeah. but we share the same sensitiveness, the same sensibility, the same ideas, the same human values. So you cannot teach someone human values if he's dead to himself, if he's watching futile videos that do not mean anything. What is happening in Palestine does not mean anything to him. Yeah. What is happening in India with castes, etc., with Muslim skin, it does not mean anything to him. Or, or quite the opposite. Sometimes they would say, this is my enemy, kill him. Kill him. This is my enemy. So you cannot... So you need to teach the values. You need to, the spirit of criticism, take distance from things. Because what we have is that people swallow these things without any discussion, without any criticism. 
They don't criticize. They take, they swallow yeah. them without criticism. We at our age, we, we were taught philosophy, we were taught other subjects, the idea, the tools that you use in order to, to fight for your ideas, to explain your ideas. But now, if you, and this is part of uh, the problems of terrorism, yeah. it is that preachers, those who predicate them, those who teach them, you can find a doctor, an engineer, whatever, is taught by somebody who has no education because he told him that Quran has taught us this, etc. And he has no tools because there are many people like me and you, etc., who don't have an idea outside their speciality. Outside their speciality. I'm sure that you have seen doctors that do not care about what's happening. They're good doctors, but, but they, they're human. Uh, they have got values, but they don't care what is happening the outside the, their world. We need to have people that have many ideas inside their work, but many insights outside them. They believe they should believe not only on their well-being, but on the well-being of other people. The people who believe that their well-being is not going to be perpetrated, uh, go, is not going to go on without the, the perpetration of a, We have in Tunisia people who do not care about whether we have political prisoners or not. Whether these political prisoners have lost their jobs, whether they are tortured, whether their families, yeah. what, the feelings of their families. You need to feel this. You need to, that's a human being. So a human being is not a person who looks uh, at a video and accept what he says of it. In a human world, is a person who criticizes, who takes distance from things, who thinks that the values of uh, that people in general share the values, whether they are in this caste or the other caste, whether they, they are in this religion and the other religion. And uh, as I said, education plays an important role. Education from the family, education from school, and education from society. Okay. So we have touched up on many issues and now it's time to wrap up and uh, I think it will be good if you have uh, any suggestions to make as I compared with uh, compared the experience of Nepal and Tunisia. Uh, so anything you would like to um, say to political parties in Nepal, to civil society or any specific suggestions that you have, then we'll conclude. Yeah, I think the experience of the Arab world and the experience of Tunisia is uh, gives us both hope and uh, challenges. Yeah. And uh, as I said before, we have to learn from history. If we don't learn from history, then things are the same mistakes are going to be repeated. repeated yeah. What I say for civil society, I think, from my modest experience, is that it should have a, a political vision for the future also, so that it could help. We are facing a challenging moment in history, challenging moment with populism, with the globalization, with the disappearance of the middle class, with wars, uh, and just wars, with the weakness of international uh, system, and the international values also, such as the UN, such as other, all other mechanisms are losing their own. So we need to revive this. We need not to despair. We need to keep hope. Hope is going to give us uh, things, tools to, to make, to face all these challenges. Political parties, they need not only to work for their ideas, but to listen to people, to convince them, to speak to them, and also to work hand in hand with civil society for the better of uh, the situation. Tolerance is important. So we need to say, to challenge what is now, all the evils that exist now, and tolerance, cats, migration, and disdain of migration.
We need to listen to young people, to their problems. We need not to refuse them, to refuse their ideas, to listen to them. And we need an education, whether at school or outside school, that teach us that human values cannot be divided, are individable, whether in Nepal or in Tunisia or in India, everywhere. And I'm sure that we have come a long way and we are going to, to win, not for us, but for the humanity in future. So thank you all for watching this video patiently uh, until now and uh, see you soon in next video. Thank you very much.